Hi, welcome to Innovators number six. Imagine you've written a track that features a prominent bass line that resonates from the speakers. There's a perceived space between the notes and frequencies in the bottom end. And a friend turns to you and says, man, that bass is well dubby. When we hear the word dub, it can conjure up different connotations. For some people, it's dubstep or dub reggae, dub plates, or even dubbing audio during the recording process. However, it's the musical genre dub that I want to discuss this week. But in essence, all of those connotations are actually connected. According to Paul White in Basic Mixing Techniques, the art of dubbing or overdubbing onto a recording refers to adding further material to an existing recording. Dub music is based on this production activity. It was the art of taking a recording and manipulating sounds and structures within it and reforming it and recontextualizing it, adding something new to the arrangement or creating something new out of the constituent parts. My personal belief is that music in pretty much all its forms, styles and genres is a rhizome. I was introduced to this concept while at university by my lecturer, Jeremy Gilbert. Big up, Jeremy who I've mentioned and have quoted a number of times in my education and base lectures. Again, enroll if you haven't, www.educationandbase.online. Uh, the notion of the rhizome is a term by French philosophers Deleuze and Guattari. Described in their book A Thousand Plateaus, any point of a rhizome can be connected to any other. And as such, within the nature of music creation and the opportunity to explore all manner of sonic textures, that is why musical form, right down to its ruptures and proliferations, is comparable to a weed, a rhizome. From a musological perspective, the absorbing of musical practices, styles and techniques can be traced back throughout popular music from the 1920s and onwards, and at certain key points these developments have spawned new forms and music genres. Popular music has always contained rhizomatic principles within certain types of music genres, uh, where influence of style and technique have infiltrated various forms. For example, jazz fusion. Jazz fusion is a mix of jazz, funk, R&B, rock and non-Western musical elements. This absorption of musical ideas, techniques and sounds came of age through the use of sampling in the 1980s and had a major influence on the music that followed. It has been these fusions and adoptions of musical attributes that have forged the scenes and genres and created the need for titling or grouping similar artists together. Returning to the notion of the dub or dub music as mentioned a moment ago, this is a music genre with particular styles of production and musical practices contained in it that have developed over 50 years. This music has been an inspiration to many who have then taken some of these techniques and morphed elements of this music into new forms. For example, where would drum and bass or dubstep be without the bass weight of dub as a key foundation of their sound. So this week I'm looking at a king of this particular sound, dub. And so innovator number six goes by the name of King Tubby. Music is most definitely a part of the Jamaican way of life. The Jamaican music scene from the 1950s was in fluid development. With inspiration from the American sounds of rhythm and blues, Jamaican mento and calypso, the era of the sound system was born. This was because many working class Jamaicans were unable to afford records for personal ownership, so record store owners responded by setting up sound systems. They played records on these systems in the stores and then would charge locals to come in and listen to the latest releases. And this eventually developed into the mobile party scene that became popular from the 60s onwards. The early parties would feature MCs who would talk either in the gap between the records to keep the crowd entertained or over the records themselves. With the advent of rock and roll, the availability of imported R&B records began to dry up, and so resourcefully, local musicians and producers started looking at creating their own style, and this developed into ska. Danvir Bra has stated, the sound we now recognise as reggae grew out of ska. There are two important factors to keep in mind with reggae. First is sonic issue. Reggae was a heavier, loose, rough development of ska. And essentially what this meant was they slowed down the tempo and increased the level of bass. 
Kevin O'Brien Chang and Wayne Chen in Reggae Roots explain, the bass became stronger and more emphatic driving the beat. This allowed the drummer to play around with it a bit more, with rim shots and cymbal accents. The guitar was played in a loose, loping strum with bright exposed chords on the head of the upbeat. As well as the change in the sound that led to Roots Reggae, there also came a significant change in the ethos behind the music. And this was due to the increased influence of Rastafari upon social life in Jamaica. Lyrics in reggae became more orientated towards Old Testament Christianity, Pan-Africanism and the writings of the black nationalist leader Marcus Garvey. As reggae became the leading sound in Jamaica, key sound systems began playing dub sides or the instrumental B-sides of reggae releases at these parties. Within the context of the party dance, the dub side gave a musical bed for these MCs to rhyme over, so that the crowd could continue to feel the rhythm of a particular track. As a result, the MC or toaster became a more prominent figure in reggae culture. He became the person who spoke to the crowd and continued to broadcast the political and spiritual messages contained in the music. More importantly, as dub sides became more popular, producers and engineers began to do more than just record the instrumental track of a record. They started to add other effects, and in particular reverb and echo. They would cut back the vocals or remove them completely and have toasters come into the studio to record over the new instrumentals. These dub sides or versions became pieces of music in their own right, and dub began to dominate as the music of choice at sound system parties. King Tubby wasn't the first to create a dub or version. The release of the first version in 1967 is one of the most famous turning points in the history of Jamaican music. One evening in 1967, Rudolph Ruddy Redwood, operator of the Supreme Ruler of Sound Sound System, went as usual to Duke Reed's Treasure Isle recording studio to get some specials from Reed's audio engineer Byron Smith. However, as stated by Steve Barrow and Peter Dalton in The Rough Guide to Reggae, as he ran through the tapes of The Paragons on the Beach, Byron Smith inadvertently left the vocal track off. This instrumental version became a huge success at Ruddy's next dance. After playing the original with vocal, he dropped the instrumental, and as described by Lloyd Bradley in Bass Culture, this was a spine-tingling moment, with the crowd singing along, replacing the missing vocal. Versions then became the new craze with Jamaican music audiences and producers, and in a couple of years the B-sides of Jamaican singles almost universally provided a version of the vocal track pressed on the A-side. These first versions constituted recordings where the vocal track had simply been removed, muted from the original song, and sometimes replaced by an instrumental. And then, enter King Tubby, or as he was christened, Osborne Ruddock. It was practically impossible to make dubs in Jamaica or anywhere else in the world before 1963, simply because the music performers, musicians and vocalists were recorded onto a single track. Even if early recording techniques could to some extent be used creatively, mainly through the placement of microphones, it was not possible to reinterpret a set of tracks once recorded. Studio reinterpretation only really became possible after 1963 with the introduction of multi-track recording consoles, which allowed for the rearrangement and alteration of different musical parts. Volume, balance and timbre of the different tracks could be modified, while sound effects like delay, echo and reverb could be used and external sounds added. The first dub came in 1967, and by 1968 King Tubby would elevate the version, or dub, to an art form that would inform the music style in many ways. Throughout this period, as money was generally hard to come by for everyone, Jamaican audio engineers tended to work at the frontier of technological constraints, using equipment passed down from studio to studio. Engineers skilled enough to modify audio equipment had an advantage, as new effects or techniques could be applied to the music. King Tubby, with his background in electrical engineering, stood far above the others in this respect. And to quote David Howard in Sonic Alchemy, Visionary Music Producers and Their Maverick Recordings, Tubby created customised reverb machines, makeshift equalisers and homemade delay units. His most important enhancement involved replacing the board's four worn-out sliding volume faders with newer, more resilient sliders, 
that afforded him far greater command and control over the mixing levels. By improving the flexibility of the faders, Tubby was given a clear advantage over competing engineers. In 1968, Tubby also ran his own rig for parties, Tubby's hometown hi-fi. As argued by Lloyd Bradley, Tubby was probably the first to use high-frequency horn tweeters and later made use of the embryonic transistor technology and custom-built filters to split his frequencies between two different amplifiers. A valve amp for the bass, transistor for the treble. Weight and treble as it's still known. He introduced echo, reverb and sound effects to the dance by bringing a range of specially built or modified outboard gear to his control tower. Tubby then became essentially the number one sound in Kingston. King Tubby's ability to reform pre-recorded music into new sonic soundscapes meant he became sought out as a remixer. His customers included the producers that only a few years previously had been shaping and creating the reggae sound, such as Glenn Brown, Winston Riley, Lee Scratch Perry, Augustus Pablo and Bunny Lee. Now they were coming to Tubby for some more righteous dub. Even if you're not particularly familiar with Tubby's productions, you will have certainly heard the characteristics of a typical Tubby production within dub music of all kinds. Bunny Lee, interviewed for Bass Culture, stated, He could make music out of the mistakes people bring him, like every spoil is a style to King Tubby. He would drop out the bits where a man sing a wrong note and bring up another instrument, or drop out everything for pure bass and drum rhythm. Then he'd bring back in the singing. You would never know there was a mistake there because he would always drop in and out of tracks, like that's what he was always intending to do. He'd do it all live too. Mikey Dredd argued, He is one of the most brilliant person I've ever met, intellectually as well as technically. It's because he truly understood sound, in a scientific sense, that he was able to do what he did. He knew all the theories of how sound work, as well as understanding how all the circuits worked and what electronics did what. Tubby added pressure sensitive switches to his effects units, which allowed him to determine how affected a sound would be. One famous example he pioneered is his thunderclap sound featured in many tracks, or passing certain hi hat and snare hits through a high pass filter to accentuate certain frequencies to achieve a specific production value to his sound a kind of splashing effect that became known as the flying symbol. Tubby's work in the studio gave Dub, in the words of Eric Davis in Sound Unbound, a deeply spatial sensibility. Polyrhythmic drums anchored by bass while snatches of melody appear, echo and fade and pan across the sound system. Eric Davis also argues that Tubby's production aesthetics and his musical inventiveness meant that Dub translated this rhythmic complexity into an abstract electroacoustic space using technology to further destabilize the beats and to stretch and fold the passage of time. If you were to look at the development of dub from 1968 to 1973, you'll certainly hear how the early tracks are quite restrained with limited effects due to the availability of the technology. But as the genre develops, so do the production techniques and aesthetics. Lloyd Bradley states that the 1973 album Blackboard Jungle Dub, essentially a King Tubby and Lee Perry collaboration, was the beginnings of what was to make King Tubby an icon in the world of music production. Tubby didn't produce anything. Other producers would bring in master tapes for him to remix or version. And by 1975, he was being credited on singles, not just mixed by, and several albums followed. Titles such as King Tubby's Meets Rockers Uptown, Rockers Meets King Tubby's in a Firehouse, King Tubby Meets the Upsetter at the Grassroots of Dub, showed that the remixer could be as important as the artist, and in some cases the remix was more popular than the original, as seen with King Tubby's Meets Rockers Uptown. This album is seen as the epitome of Dub. The strength of the production showcased Tubby's skill at manipulating pre-existing material to such a degree that when the record was pressed as a single, instead of featuring the vocal cut of the album's titled track Baby I Love You So by Jacob Miller on side A, Island Records reversed the running order, presenting King Tubby's Meets Rockers Uptown first instead. Where Tubby led, others would then follow. 
Tubby's influence on Dub would be cemented by the production apprentices he would take under his wing, such as scientist Prince Jammy and Mikey Dredd, who would learn under his guidance how to manipulate sounds the Tubby way. Dub soon escaped Jamaica's shores and became an internationally recognised sound, with it taking root particularly in the UK. The sounds and techniques pioneered by King Tubby would find favour in the burgeoning reggae scene from the early 80s and onwards, and this in turn would inform the electronic dance music genres that began to coalesce by the end of the decade and into the 90s. David Toop writes in Audio Culture, Readings in Modern Music, that manipulating the instrumental arrangement with techniques and effects, drop out, extreme equalisation, long delay, short delay, space echo, reverb, flange, phase, noise gates, echo feedback, shotgun snare drums, rubber bass, zipping highs, cavernous lows, techniques we see in modern dance music production, all began with King Tubby. He also states that these effects not only enhance the music, but for a dub master, they can displace time, shift the beat, heighten the mood, suspend a moment. Eric Davis in Sound Unbound says that Dub came to be seen as a technological virus. Its silly putty beats, active silences and bubbling booming bass as nomadic codes that have wormed their way into a host of musical genres. Ambient, industrial, trip-hop, two-step, dancehall, techno, pop, jungle and experimental rock. So, without these experiments in sound production undertaken by King Tubby, these modern music genres would probably sound flat dynamically and less three-dimensional. Tubby taught us to appreciate the space between the notes and the frequencies, and hence King Tubby is innovator number six. Thanks very much. See you next time.